These parables will provide direct blows to one's humanity. Be mindful to watch who you become in comparison to what you read. Find within yourself a state of neutrality that will bear upon you the wisdom necessary to move forward, embracing that which is irreversibly absorbed. The Parable of the Dog Many years ago, I lived in a village in Bali, where the veil between the worlds was so thin that on occasion you could almost step right through. As I would sit on the balcony looking over the green rice fields at dusk, I would experience a profound sense of quietude, peace, and fulfillment, listening to wild birds singing in the distance. I had many Balinese friends who were exquisitely tender and beautiful, who held my being gently, as if it were a fragile flower that would disintegrate if more than the grasp of their eyes would observe it. And then there were a majority who would openly call you ghost person or orang hantu in Indonesian for they believed that non-Balinese people were spiritually inferior. The story I am to tell is something that we will all understand, no matter what our origins. The abstract core within this narrative will be obvious to everybody who reads it, whether it be holistically embraced or narrowly, subjectively viewed. The impasse that unfolds for one innocent being will bear weight upon the eyes that travel upon this dark parable to its formidable conclusion within one's consciousness. I will ask you not to judge the story if you become bound emotionally, for, unfortunately, a high moral ground will not allow you to see deeply into what will be conveyed. It is the humble eyes that come upon these parables that will deliver a perspective that yields many incremental elements to be awakened, connected to everything that was in your life and to all that eventually will become apparent within fractally unfolding insights. For many nights, as dusk was descending upon the rice fields, I heard the wailing and crying of a young dog. I could hear that it was a puppy that had not yet reached maturity. Within its whimpering, you could see that it did not understand the perilous position it was in, and this anguish was easily transferred to anyone within earshot. Everybody recognizes the cry of a child, the sound of innocence traveling through the air. After about six or seven days, I asked my very good friend Giwi what was happening, and why these tormented sounds were filling the crisp morning ether and the dying embers of the sun at twilight. He promptly explained, and as I listened to his description I was shocked, yet simultaneously awakened to many intricacies within that horrific account. He said that the puppy was being prepared for a ritual killing by a priest. He mentioned that they are always taken young, before they have a chance to even realize that they are a dog through social contact. This ensures that his innocence is more easily manipulated. For many weeks, the dog would be collared and chained to a post with no bed, shade, nor any protection from the elements. Its bowl of water would be just out of reach and the minute amount of food that was left for him would be placed even further away. Every day, the water would be nudged closer for only a moment, so that his thirst could be quenched just barely, and only every now and then a portion of food would be taken and thrown towards him. He would never have full access to nourishment, and at this stage was reduced to skin and bone. The scraps would not be enough to survive on but would ensure that the body of the dog would experience its inevitable death coming upon itself. This goes on for weeks. One day, when the collared dog's agony reaches an untenable impasse, it looks up, wide-eyed, intending to leave its mortal coil. At this juncture, the priest grabs the dog by the scruff of the neck and forces its body down to the ceremonial bowl, piercing its carotid artery with a dagger called a chris so as to force its blood to flow downward. This plummeting momentum prevents the dog's spirit from ascending at the point of his departure. The Balinese priest would thus ritualistically steal its life essence to invoke incantations that would be the end result of that cruel enactment towards this blameless being. 
As Giwi conveyed the full scope of what was taking place, I felt grief, and at the same time a sense of terrible despondency for not being capable of intervening such treachery and disregard for life. It was something that I could not really come to terms with, yet had to, simultaneously. Dogs are well known for their capacity to see the approach of a witch, and in Bali this is very evident. Once a month there is a crescent moon, which is when most black magic is performed. One day before and one day after that event, Everybody leaves their lights on outside at night. Each household has at least one dog as a guard, and there are many wild packs wandering the streets. They would all howl more than usual at this time of the month, for they could see incantations being intended or flung in the air towards prospective victims. Dogs have been our loyal companions for thousands of years, always forewarning us of approaching danger, whether it be physical or etheric. Their barking is like a slamming door to an incantation, by virtue of alerting other awarenesses to that approach. The howling is the indication that a spell has passed its guard and embedded itself within their owner, the intended victim. The suffering of the recipient of the black magic is relayed as the dog's unhappiness through their whimpering, which in actual fact is mimicking the cries obtained from that beautiful puppy. In this way, the witch knows that the spell has been successfully cast, and thus the collar tightened upon his victim. At this stage within the parable, I would like to assist you in recognizing one point that you may not have realized is there to be seen. By doing this, I'm helping you define your ability to access realizations that come upon you as orbs of light, even though this story is full of darkness. Using the hieroglyph of completion is complex, to say the least. But here I will share with you what I have done, so that you may more clearly understand where darkness reveals the light. The puppy wailing was part of the story. Its suffering was a persistence through the parable. The priest wished to obtain its blood for ceremonial purposes, by virtue of the fact that this young being's awareness had not yet been socialized, Consequently, giving his blood a different signature to the guard dog that the priest wished to bypass to deliver his sinister blow. The victim's loyal companion would not detect the incantation, for even though there is a spell traveling upon the blood's vibration, it retains the pure signature of the puppy's innocence, thus masking crucial elements that relay alerting information that is part of that canine protector's paradigm. The internal process of that guard dog, which is connected to an interdimensional complex of eyes that observes the world of magic in a way that belongs to this species alone, is bypassed by that alchemical trickery by virtue of the fact that he is looking for the conditioned elements first. By the time he realizes that it was a trap, it is too late. When I mentioned to be diligently aware not to judge the content of the narrative, this is what I meant. Be careful not to assume you know, for that assumption may block your ability to see the magic that arises within you, via the fact that your socialized beingness may not be capable of grasping the intangible, which is our inherent capacity to be aware of the inaudible, non-locatable anomalies that nevertheless can be heard and detected by our emptiness. If we ourselves have a clear frequency, insofar as not being socialized, meaning that we are empty within our innocence, wisdom will avail itself unyieldingly to our open-heartedness as eternity's treasure trove of information. Even if that light shines upon negativity, it will bring about transformation as a result of the witness's observation. All things will be seen that necessitate the steps that must be traversed in terms of the path revealing itself. The Parable of the Deer In numerous cultures there is a principle called persistence hunting, which was something we practiced before we created long-range weaponry, such as spears and arrows and so forth. There are many techniques employed to gather the strength and endurance necessary for this type of activity. Some tribes employed chewing coca leaves with psychotropic substances. 
Others used different methods to enhance their power. These were mainly hunter-gatherers, who very rarely ate large amounts of animal proteins. In essence, persistence hunting was seen as highly ritualistic and filled with meaning in terms of the belief system of each tribe that practiced it. But we needn't be drawn into these separate ritualized factors. Even though they are relevant with regard to discovering their inherent contradictions, it is more important to arrive upon the pure conclusion of what this activity really represents within this parable. Four or five hunters would scout and visually locate the tracks of a deer, and as they did this, they would wave their hands in a mudra-like gesture above the footprints to absorb the frequency of the animal's imprint within the compacted area where it had left its trail. This subtle emanation would then be infused in the body of the hunter, and the one with the most receptivity would inadvertently become the leader as the group would begin to run slowly towards their prospective prey. The frequency obtained would mix with the stimulant taken and then resoundingly beat within the heart of the lead hunter as a receptor to become stronger the closer they get to the deer. When this connection is fully established, then the chase truly begins. If this link is not found, the hunt is not pursued, for the bridge of heart resonance must be secured for the ultimate kill to be clean. This is to avoid frequential discordance, for if the electromagnetic bond is not made with the deer's heart, that disharmony will spread through the community via its consumption, causing widespread unhappiness. Once this crucial resonance is set, the hunter runs behind and beside the deer for a period of 10 to 15 hours. It can even go beyond this, lasting days. At no point is the hunter to have any form of aggression nor malice towards the animal as he runs it down. It is imperative that the deer give up its life freely, knowing that it cannot escape the hunter's combination of willpower, endurance, and his unbending intention. As the chase reaches its crescendo, which in actuality is the relenting of the deer's ability to continue, through sheer exhaustion it surrenders, and at that point the eyes of the hunter and the deer meet. Only when the deer does not attempt to get up and run again is it appropriate for the shaman to gently take its chin, leaning its head backwards, to quickly cut the carotid artery and windpipe, to sever the nerves of the spinal cord, so that the kill is clean and the animal is accepting of its fate? These two stories will have an irreversible effect upon your consciousness, if you become open to them in the right way, in terms of reflecting upon your dilemma as a human being. Our life is intimately interconnected with both parables. We are being impersonally run down until we are exhausted, and upon that point our spirit leaves. Realize that death is the ultimate hunter. Knowing this, resolve to be clear and strong, and intend never to be collared by your circumstances, whilst viewing them impartially, just like death itself.